tell the audience about how you got started in real estate? John, welcome to the podcast, man. Thanks for having me. So I want to start off with your background and kind of uh, move into what you're doing today. You know, you started off as an architect and now you have, you know, you're part of a development team. So let's start back. You mentioned before the show, you learned how to be an architect in the eighth grade. Yeah, I, I knew, I knew early on that I, I, I loved architecture. It kind of started when I was really young uh, with Legos. I would, I'd build the set and then you know, by the instructions. And then after I tear it apart and I would, I would reconstruct it in my own, own right. And it wasn't until it was eight, eighth grade where you do like the whole career day thing. And I realized I could kind of do that for a living. And so I was like, sweet, like, yeah. let's, let's do this. And so since then, um, I knew I want to be an architect. And so from there, I, you know, I just started, started studying architecture. I took drafting in high school, got a drafting certificate through a tech college my senior year and learned AutoCAD and kind of just jumped right in. Um, you know, I, 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 I went on a church mission right after high school. And right when I got home a month after I got home, I started working in a firm, um, in 2005 and kind of the rest was history. Did you, uh, you went to college and got a degree, was it in architecture and then a master's program as yeah. well? Yep. Yeah. I, um, I did everything at, at the U, um, here in Salt Lake. I just, yeah, got my, um, my bachelor's of architectural studies and then went straight through and got my master's of architecture. And you mentioned, you know, you don't really come out of college or a master's degree and jump into being an architect, but you did say you learned some valuable stuff. What did you learn yeah. while you were in college? And yeah. Masters? You know, the, the main preface of, um, of, you know, an architecture degree is they, they just teach you how to think um, different and think outside the box. You know, the, the core curriculum of both the undergrad and masters is, is just creativity, is, is design, how to, how to solve problems through design. And so the, the, the core class, which is called just the design studio, which is, you know, takes up nine hours of your, of your week, is you're designing mock projects and you're, you're just racking your brain on how to do it differently. And, and so in school, you're, you're not really learning much about the technicalities. It's changed a bit since I've been in school and they're, they're getting a lot more into building science, but really it's, they're just ingraining in your brain how to just think creatively. Um, and what are some, I think we'll get into this a little bit more, but I, I think not to be too artistic about it, but when you look at a blank piece of land, it really is kind of a canvas for art. So I think most developers default is kind of build the same box every single time. I don't know if you can do this like right now, but what are some kind of things that you would change? Like when you're tearing, tearing stuff apart and rebuilding it, what were like some of the key changes that you would make on these projects? So it's, you know, every different piece of land has different constraints. So it's it's very hard to rinse and repeat. A lot of people do it, but sometimes with doing so, you miss out on great great opportunities to make the project better. Um, you know, constraints really are great catalysts. You know, to create a project that's completely unique and stands out in the you know urban environment or, or city or rural or wherever it is. And so, if if you kind of embrace those constraints instead of try to like stiff arm them. Um, you can create really interesting architecture and create really interesting projects. I think let's kind of sidebar there for a little bit. Uh, t on today's episode, I want to go over kind of architecture 101. And you mentioned in a different video that you sent me, uh, you do a lunch and learn with Alchemy Development. And you talked about a deal, uh, you can name the city if you want, but uh, let's talk about how you, know, you worked with a family on a consulting basis they had a design with a different architect and you kind of uh, modified that, you and Josh. Let's talk about that for a little bit. Yeah, we, we had a consulting gig uh, come to us that it was a family that 
they they have a pretty large swath of land. It's in, it's in Provo. Um, uh, I won't give much more detail just out of uh, privacy for them. Um, but they had uh, they, they had an architect to do a layout for them. Uh, the architect, it was obvious he'd worked with a lot of developers. He just crammed as many units as he could into it. Um, it it's a pretty decent, good sized piece of, of land they have. But he ended up, you know, it's it's in the D1 zone of, of Provo, so they can go high. Um, but it is on the outskirts of the D1. Um, but he, this architect gave them a design that was a three three level podium uh, with 91 units on top of it. Um, and Long stories of it was he he tapped out at, at five stories. Um, so it was it, he he maxed out what you can do under type three construction. Um, so yeah, it was 90 it was 91 units. Um, it was kind of a donut donut shape. So there was 30 percent of the units looked in at each other. Um, and you know, a lot of architects just quick sidebar you know, working with developers, they always hear density, density, density. Um, I would never tell an architect <laughs> that. And they, they don't, you know, luckily working, you know, on the other side of the table, on the development side, I've, I've been able to learn kind of, you know, all the different facets and light items that go into perform and, you know, um, you know, vacancy is a big issue with your NOI and um, how quickly you can lease the, the units. And so sometimes when you try to cram in a bunch of units, Sometimes you kind of get some bad units like these ones. There's 30%. So 30, let's just say 30 of the 91 units, they looked in on each other in the courtyard. This donut courtyard was so small. It's like a you could table. <laughs> you, yeah. You could like huck a cup of flour to your neighbor, you know, that if he needed it, you know, it, it was that tight. So it was just looking at it. You know, that those would be the last units that would lease and, you know, I'm assuming that they'd have to probably give some pretty hefty concessions just because you couldn't even, it was so tight. You wouldn't even be able to see the, you know, the mountains or any, you wouldn't be able to see any of the urban neighborhood. And there's of it. literally no reason to live in Provo other than the mountain views. Yeah. So. Right. So we, we kind of looked at it and, um, you know, and, and to build a building like that, the equity, equity check was, it was big, right. The, this, you know, this family has a lot of equity in the land because they own it in this family trust. And so we started looking at it and, and this is where I think developers should really, really link arms with their architect uh, and whoever's doing their underwriting because, you know, Josh and I sat down and we just started, I just pulled out a, you know, my, my laptop and created some Lego blocks of saying, okay, here's a, here's, here's an average unit size. Let's start looking at this and, you know, let's maybe look at a whole all townhome option. And then let's look at, you know, no podium. Let's just do type five construction. You're just conventional, uh, you know, non-treated wood option. How many units do you get that? And then if we bump up to type three, let's do a single level podium just to kind of keep costs low. And looking at that, we, we came up with three scenarios. Um, one was the, the 91 units that was the original design. Um, then we did... Uh, it was a 51 unit, I think. I think you're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 51. And that was a, a type three construction with a with a, a podium, but it was just a single level podium that you'd, um, you'd park underneath and on, on one suspended slab. Uh, and then we'd had one that was, and that was, that was four stories. And then we did one that was three stories with the podium. Um, and it was interestingly enough that for this family, the returns were substantially greater for the 51 unit than the 92 unit, 91 unit. Um, Just from a vacancy turnover and yeah. also the and equity check. Yeah, as the well. size of the equity check because they found that doing that, they could actually, with the value of their land plus a lot of them pulling their money together, them as just the family could just act as a GP and go finance this deal. Or if they do this other one, they'd have to bring on some LPs and, you know, raise a bunch of money and, and really, at the end of the day, their chunk, their piece of their pie, their IRR was worse than if they were just doing the smaller project. Um, and so it was just interesting to just, you know, have an iterative design process with Josh as the underwriter just sitting right next to me saying, okay, what if we do this? You know, 
This will make hard costs a little bit less because it's a different construction type. What if we do this? Went through all these till we honed in on these these two other options, and now um, you know it, it sits in the city in the family's um, lap. And now they're kind of looking at pooling the resources of just doing this themselves um, from a financing standpoint. And you know they'll have a great legacy project for their family that they're the only partners in it. And so they're receiving all the cash flow and they're not having to deal with partners. It's beautiful. So um, you mentioned you were sitting side by side with Josh kind of going through the underwriting. Let's talk about if I'm a, we'll say I'm a multifamily developer yeah, and I want to, I don't have an architect yeah. in staff or a partner with me. How do I, you know, w- one, work with architects and two, maximize what they can do for me? Yeah, yeah. I, I think... You know, I definitely, I don't know if there's a specific right way, but I think there's a wrong way. Um, I think how a lot of people work today, um, and it's just because that's how it's been done, is, you know, they'll identify a piece of land, they'll call up an architect, hey, look at the zoning, lay this out for me. Get me get Again, me, I would never. Get, I, yeah, I just have. get me something so I can, I can run a pro forma, see if it's a deal. And then that's it. Architect goes away for a couple of days, throws something together, throws it to him, they run a run a pro forma. It either works or it doesn't work. And they either try to pursue it or they, they move on. To the couple of architects I've done that to, I just want to apologize. So. Yeah. No, and it, but it's like it's not that that's a pretty standard way of doing it. Um, but a better way, and it that way is not always wrong. I think in today's market it probably is because things are getting harder and harder to pencil. But the the better way is to call your architect up and say, hey come to our office or let me come down. Can we look at this? You know, can we, can we schedule a, a meeting for an hour? Just bring a trace paper, bring sketch up. Let's look at this. Let's lay out a few different things. And you tell me what you think from, from the architect's experience, you know, does that change the construction type? Does this require something else? A couple additional bells and whistles. Um, and then, you know, if, if he comes up with this crazy elaborate design, but um, it, you as a developer see something that's maybe weird from an operation standpoint, the more you can teach the architect about the, you know, the other half of the project of once it's built and stabilized and you're running it, um, those are the lessons learned that a lot of architects never, never hear about. Unless they watch the show. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. But but it's true. There's I have a lot of colleagues that, you know, just they've never thought about um you know if i if i spec this really cool looking wood that's um you know looks good now but it needs to be treated you know every other year or with with some tongue seed oil or 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 something like that just to keep its kind of color you know that's going to be a big expense to the operator and that's going to hurt your noi and a lot of times you know architects are there to make beautiful buildings um and so beautiful vacant buildings. Yeah. Yeah. But they oftentimes they don't understand that sometimes, you know, those moves they make in the design really impact, uh, you know, you as a developer, if you're holding it long term. And so the more that you can communicate and educate your architect, the, the better. And so it's just important to have a really good relationship with whatever architect you use. So how do you balance that line? Because there's, Obviously, on one end of the spectrum, you have the big, beautiful, vacant building. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have, you know, 91 micro units where it shouldn't be. So how do you balance, you know, building a great building, but also getting the best bang for your buck as far as materials and design goes? Yeah. So how do you balance that? It, Yeah, it's a true That's balance. And <laughs> I, uh, I, I don't know if I have it totally figured out, to be completely honest. But I think, you know what? On the one spectrum of you know of crazy density with a bunch of micro units, I I tell uh, you know clients I work with now if if you yourself or or a family member of yours you know like if you have a college kid if you're you're a little bit older like if you couldn't reside in the space for more than a day or two, um, it's probably not the right idea. Um, and so I, I think that's something we always have to ask is, you know, micro units, I think they, they do serve a purpose and I think there is a need for them. 
that I don't, <laughs> I think, and, and this is just me speaking, I don't have any facts to back this up. So, but like, I, I think there's been a lot that have been built lately. I and I think, agree. I think a lot are just enamored. They see the cost per square foot that they, they can get from it. And it really helps the pro forma. And so they tell the architect, you know, get as many micros as you can in there because it's helping our numbers. But really, when you look at a micro, just historically, um, people that live in a micro unit, they, they're pretty transitionary. So they typically move quite a bit. So you're going to be leasing them quite often and you're going to have a, a big turnover. And so where, yeah, you might be getting a higher, you know, lease per square foot because they're smaller and you can push, push the rent. If it sits vacant for two months out of the year compared to a one bed or a two bed that is always consistently rented at the end of the day, you might end up being closer to being sixes. So, um, I just think that from the density standpoint and then from just like quality materials, making it look good. Um, I just think good design could be done on any budget. I think it's a little bit of a cop out to say, well, this building would have been nicer if we had, you know, a hundred grand more to throw the exteriors in it, which don't get me wrong. It is easier, but at the same time, if you, if and it goes back to communication with your architect, if you can just tell your architect up front where you really want your cost to be, they can work from day one to, to make a building that fits that. Because we've all had projects where we shoot for the stars and then the bids come back and we have to value engineer and you start shipping the corners off and stripping stuff back. And sometimes when those buildings are built, you can tell like, yeah, that was probably VE there and this was cut off. Where if you just go in um, with kind of a target then I think you end up with a better one. And it and unfortunately, the, the answer can't be, Mr. Architect, design me the cheapest building possible. <laughs> like, because that that's really hard too, because like, well, your def definition of cheapest building possible and your architects, they might not be aligned. So it, it is good to kind of draw, you know, draw the lines and then everybody's running towards the same goal. And is there, you know, you talked about best bang for your buck. Is there any places where you think you should oh, maybe quote overspend? Like do you dedicate an extra 10% of the budget to the exterior and cut I, back some stuff on the inside? I think any element, whether it's on the exterior, interior, any element that a building occupant interacts with daily is where you should spend your money. This so is really good that, because like that is what, when somebody goes to lease a building, whether it's a commercial building, a multifamily, whatever, when they go through there and they interact with those building elements for the first time, that's going to leave. They're going to know right then if they want that space or not. And so that's where you want to spend your money. Um, Can you give some examples of that? Yeah. Like we're just, I, I just finished a, a project that's a mixed use project in Logan um, we wanted to keep a nicer finishes and we're looking, you know, we actually met with the development team and the contractor and we decided, look, we want to keep these things. Where are some other places we can save money? Um, Logan city was, you know, a lot of people are going to all electric and buildings cause it saves money on gas, gas piping and, and you don't have things. to deal with the gas company. Yeah. Hopefully and, 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 and venting listening. to the roof and stuff, but the, the power grid Logan was a little skittish with the size of this project going on electric. And so something else we looked at, well, what are, what other ways we can save money? And we actually are going to a central boiler system for hot water. So now this is a 120 unit, um, apartment building with 40 hotel rooms. Um, instead of have 160 electric water heaters, um, now we have a central boiler system that heats all of them. And it's one of those things, um, they, we, we talked about it a couple of days ago, it's going to be $20,000 more up front. But then as they looked at the maintenance in the first three years of maintaining all those electrical water heaters, um, it's, yeah, they'll, you, they'll have the payback in it's, it's actually less than two years. Um, and so, you know, so that doesn't help the, the upfront cost, but I think it's, it's really important to just look at the holistic view. Um, so going to that route, they're saving money and it helped their NOI um, to go that route. 
And so we were able to save kind of some of we we're doing nicer plumbing fixtures, uh, nicer cabinets, nicer countertops, nicer flooring, you know, all those things that the building tenants, they interact with yeah. constantly. Mm -hmm. So we're keeping the, the nice, pretty finishes, but the building components, we're just, we're doing it different. And in, in this case, it's not really even inferior. It's just different um, than what's been typically done um, up there anyways with kind of your standalone systems for each unit. And this is a good, I wanted to bring up this Logan project because you mentioned on the other video that I watched, kind of understanding the city ordinance is better than the city. Yeah. This is something I've struggled with early on in my career is the city knows the ordinance is way better than I do. So let's talk about kind of that Logan, I think is a great example of that. Yeah, it's, you know, and this is where, I, I'm kind of starting to sound like a broken record, but like if you can, as a, as a developer, link arms with the architect and, you know, typically a lot, majority of developers have that very analytical mind. Architect has a very kind of creative side of mind. If you guys can sit down and just go through the zoning, zoning ordinance line by line, um, you know, you can find opportunities in those constraints. So this, this Logan one, um, the zone wouldn't allow multifamily units on the ground floor. Um, this area, this, this deal is kind of on the outskirts of, of Logan as you drive in on 89. And, you know, to have, you know, 12,000 feet of lease space in both buildings, so 24,000 feet is just, I think any commercial broker up there would say it's a little foolish. And so we're like, well, man, what what can we do? Because, you know, obviously having a blank floor in each building was killing the pro forma on the revenue side. Um, so we're like, well, okay, let's let's look through the 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 uh, the land use matrix. Like, what can we do? Because um, it has to be per, per the ordinance, it has to be a commercial space. Um, and oddly enough, uh, hotel motel was listed under commercial in their zone. So we're like, wait a minute. Uh, what's the difference between an apartment unit and a hotel? Like, and so we called and asked for the definition of hotel motel. And it was, um, it was anything that was leased less than 30 days. We're like, okay, done. So they, they talked to their property manager and they said, hey, would, would you guys manage like a, a long-term, a, a long-stay hotel? And they're like, yeah, we'd do that. So we ended up putting quote unquote hotel units on the ground floor and, and they are, they're a different unit than what's up in the multifamily, but they'll be leased up to 30 days. And now we, they used 80% of the, of, of the level one floor space. And now there's left over 4,000 square foot lease spaces. That's a little bit more realistic for that area. Um, and so, you know, and so when we went to planning commission to get the design review approval, it kind of caught everyone off guard, but we said, look, it's listed right there that we can do it. So, and I love that you did that because for the person that doesn't understand urban planning or has never gone through a city entitlement process, the city does that all the time where they say, you can totally build apartments if you have, you know, five stalls or four stalls or three stall stalls per unit. And it just makes it impossible to do yeah. that. So yeah. I'm very happy that you got to, you know, play the other side of that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we, and we, we had multiple meetings with the city be like, okay, this is how we we're reading this. Are we, are we reading this accurately? And you know, and we, we were open to them. We, it's not like we were trying to hide something, but we said, look, we, we see this opportunity in your, in your zone, your, your written code. Like, is this, can we do this? And they're like, yeah, I, I guess you can. Um, so, and that just goes back to just kind of, you know, oftentimes an architect, is seen as kind of an outside consultant to the development team where really the more you can almost treat them as a team member um, and really just have them sit at the table with you and hear the side conversations you're having on the revenue side, on the financing side, it just helps the architect, you know, understand all those different facets because then he can incorporate, you know, if there's something that is a cause and effect that, would um would change the design you know he can jump in and do it but you know architects only know what they they, they only know what they know and they don't know what they don't know so 
the more that you can kind of let them in on every nitty gritty detail, um, you'll get more use out of them. And I, I guess this kind of goes along, but it's some more do's and don'ts of, you know, working with an architect and uh, contractors, I guess. Let's talk about how to run, you know, OAC meetings, because yeah. sometimes those are a little controversial and maybe a little spicy sometimes. So let's, working with those, let's talk about do's and don'ts with that. Yeah, yeah, you know, an, an owner-architect contractor meeting, you know, once you've kind of got through the, the city and you got your permit, you're starting construction, um, you know, they're, they're really important meetings um, because especially in this, the world we live in now, just supply chain issues, uh, material costs, you know, swings up and down and unavailability. It's the OAC meetings are very important. And um, it, you know, we all know that the construction process and just development process, it's a bumpy road. It's, it's a long process. It's kind of archaic how we do it. Um, we, we fumble through it sometimes and issues come up in construction. I don't care how tight the drawing set is and I don't care how good the contractor is. It's just, it's kind of part of construction is that issues will pop up. Um, and so I just think, you know, there, there's times, as you said, they can get a little spicy and uh, a lot of finger pointing, you know, there might be an omission or error in the drawings, or there might be an oversight from the contractor, or the developer owner can't make up his mind or keeps changing his mind, right? And I think it's just important to just, when you start a project, just lay the ground rules to be like, look, we know, we know crap's going to happen. There's going to be issues. There's going to be problems we have to solve. Let's just go into this project knowing, like, we're not going to point fingers even if it's blatantly obvious whose fault it is, but like, let's just come and say, let's, let's just find a solution. Um, you know, oftentimes there's been a lot of projects where I'd have a mini meeting with the contractor before, if there were some issues we had to work through so that when the owner came, um, we could be like, here's this issue. We've already talked about it. Here's two or three different solutions. You know, you as the owner, Mr. Developer, which one do you like more? Um, and I think just going into it like that, knowing that like everyone's not out to like peg someone for an, a, a, you know, a mistake they made because we're, we're all human at the end of the day. So I, I think going into it like that will make the whole process way smoother. I think that's that what you just said is something that a good architect would do. Let's talk about, you know, what the good architect, what else the good architects do versus the bad architects like let's say i'm you're licensed in utah idaho and washington I'm, I'm about to get my license in washington so yeah. let's say someone's in west virginia right now and you have no ambitions of helping them in west virginia but they need to find an architect what should they be looking for how should they interview them i just think more you know a lot of it because you have to have the numbers pencil and a lot of time as you the developer what you're paying the architect is money you have to pay up front, right? Because they're kind of the first, one of the first consultants. So a lot of times it's driven by price. Like, well, let's just be honest. A lot of times it's just who's, who's got the cheapest fee and how quick can they get it to us? Um, which time is, is important. But I think it's important that the cheapest, obviously you get what you pay for, right? Um, there's a lot of good affordable architects out there. Um, I'm not gonna say there's not. There's there's some great ones that do tons of work for developers here. Um, one thing where they might be lacking is a lot of them that are cheaper. They still use just a uh, 2D CAD um, to do all their drafting, which you can draw really fast. Um, but not doing it in BIM software like Revit or ArchiCAD, you kind of miss out on some opportunities for clash detection and just to kind of see the building in full three dimension. And oftentimes when you go to the, the, the cheaper architects that can bust out extremely fast, cause it's just all 2d. If you need renderings or stuff, they'll ship those renderings off to a rendering model or he'll then model in 3d and give you renderings. And then you can kind of see it. Um, but it's kind of good. I, I say, I always recommend that people use architects that are modeling in 3d. It's just helps you as the client see it more. Um, also in selecting it, 
I would ask, um, you know, if, if, you, if you've narrowed it down to two or three architects and, you know, if, if price, you know, if, if any of their fees work, I would ask all of them for um, two or three references to other developers of similar projects to say, hey, give me a couple of references and, and, and call them and just be like, hey, how's your experience with these guys? What problems did you run into and how did he, how did he solve them? Because really the, the, the price, you know, something I think about is, you know, in a, in a development deal, you've got the land costs, which is somewhat fixed. You can, it, it could be a little bit negotiated, but like it's kind of a fixed thing, right? <laughs> yeah. Financing costs, you're kind of at the mercy of the market, right? Unfortunately um, as well. Uh, so that leaves you to hard costs is where you kind of can be in control. Well, depending on your designer, um, if they're not very thorough, um, and they're really fast, they might miss things so that, you know, you blow your contingency in the first <laughs> during footings and foundation. Never. Do um, <laughs> so like it's, that's where it's like, you know, maybe going with the the next price up or even the more expensive one if the the references pan out paying a little bit more for the architect you know in a perfect world will save you quite a bit on hard costs because you know that more expensive architects hopefully you know they're baking in like look we're spending more time on this you know with coordination with you as the owner with the contractor with the consultants so that you get a tighter set which then saves you on change orders time um, hard costs, like I mentioned. And so that's where it's, it's very important to just pick the right architect. And, you know, I, I'd love to do everyone's architecture that's listening to this, but at the same time, if there is an architect you're working with, that you have a great relationship with, like, honestly, if you have a really good relationship with your architect, that's honestly better than whatever their fee is. Because if, if you have a good relationship and you can speak very candid about your pro forma, showing the impacts of the design, you'll get a lot farther in life, you know, on any project than just going with the, the cheapest number every time. So you mentioned <clears throat> you would love to do everybody's design here. Let's give yourself a chance to uh, kind of showcase what you do versus, you know, some of the other maybe cheaper or we'll say less good architects. Yeah. Why should someone work with you instead of them? Um, I just... I think I look at, I look at every project as a unique project. I don't, I don't like to rinse and repeat things. Um, you know, there's some projects that are like, I really like this unit plan you showed me on this other project. Can we just kind of reuse that? Um, we'll take that as a starting point, but then we'll go walk the site and see how we can manipulate that unit to work better on that site. Um, and something we really do, you know, being a partner in a development company, I, I understand the kind of the facets of, of that side of the table. So that can really, that really influences the design. Um, but more importantly, we're, we're very collaborative. I, um, you know, on, on this Logan project we're referencing, since schematic design, we've had weekly meetings with the contractor that's going to be building it and some of his subs as well as all my consultants. So, you know, it, it went out to bid this week. Um, they're going to have numbers back at the end of next week just because, you know, the framers actually sat down with a structural engineer and said, hey, for this type 3B construction building, like, let's do the connection details this way. This is how we like to do it. So that's already baked into the drawings, and it kind of rolls back to that, you know, there should be savings and hard costs just because all the subs know what they're getting into because they've actually been able to influence the design, even down to the specific systems they've wanted to spec because they're like, we can get these quicker, we can install them faster, so we'll give you a, che a cheaper price. And so just that that intense collaboration is kind of what we're good at. And 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 really, it the, the initial stages of design are slower, but then it speed, it's kind of a bell curve. It speeds up really fast during the, the construction documents. And so where we probably take maybe a little bit more time than kind of some of the, the more affordable architects. Um, it's a nice way of putting it's, it. <laughs> yeah, but, but it's, it's a very thought out and uh, um, coordinated set where it's really, 
it's going to be a quicker turnaround in the city review. And then the contractor already knows what he's getting in, into. And so they can kind of hit the ground running. So the little bit of extra time spent in the design is quickly made up in cost and building time just because everybody's been involved um, during the whole design process. I guess on that note, uh, you mentioned that you're a partner at a development company. Yeah. What do you think you know sets apart Alchemy Development as a developer and kind of your, I mean, each of you have interesting and unique backgrounds and you all collaborate together. Yeah. So I guess market your development company and why you guys. Uh, yeah, I, I think we, and it's kind of in the name Alchemy, like we, we all have very diverse um, skills, you know, uh, Josh is kind of a finance and market analysis wizard um, and can underwrite anything and everything. Uh, Brandon is just the sharpest uh, kind of project manager, can just oversee the entire project, handle the construction, um, you know, understand, you know, work with the with the investors, work with the banks, just to understand everything that's going on during construction. Um, AJ, um, he's, you know, he's a lawyer, an attorney. He can draft up very good um, uh, contracts with our investors, with um, landowners and everything that just makes it a really big win-win for everyone. And then, you know, I kind of connect the dots with, with the design side. So between the four of us, we cover every facet that you need in developer development. And we kind of just focus, you know, we, we do commercial projects, we do land development, uh, we do multifamily, we kind of do it all. And we kind of, we just like to have fun. And we, we go to markets that are, are in need of development. And we just identify the specific building types that are needed. And those are the projects we go after. So we're not, we're not a we're not a multifamily developer. We're not a commercial developer. We're just a an opportunistic real estate developer. We just go and and give any community the developments that that community needs. And if someone is a current architect and they want to become a developer, a, a lot of the skills that you you know acquire as an architect and the people that you work with, they don't really cross over into development sometimes. Like the architect never talks to the investment manager or the banker or um, the landowner or the broker sometimes. If if you are a architect, you know, you just graduated, but you want to become a developer, what advice would you give them? I'd say just do it. Like it's, um, it, it's definitely the opposite side of your brain you're used to using. Um, but there there's... You know, my mentor is Jonathan Siegel. He's based out of San Diego. Um, he's an architect, developer, he's done really amazing concrete buildings in, in downtown San Diego. Um, you know, he's kind of a mentor. It's someone that they should follow. There's some continuing education AIA courses you can take that he essentially kind of spells it all out. Um, I think kind of one of his followers um, wrote a book called Architect is Developer. You can buy it on Amazon. Um, I think first steps would be they should read that book um, because it kind of starts kind of doing it. And then I just think, you know, just start talking to to developers and say, hey, I'll, I'll do your architecture and let me be part of your development team. And, you know, if, if, if you're moonlighting or you can do it on the side as an architect, say, look, I'll, I'll just contrib contribute my fee as my contribution to the project. And I think that's a that's a that's a good way to get started into the development world. And then you can kind of learn through osmosis. <laughs> like that's kind of how I have working with, with uh, Brandon, Josh and AJ is, you know, I, had, I have, I knew nothing about pro formas or what a cap rate was or NOI, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so it was just, I think from an architect's perspective, don't, I think this just goes in general to anyone working in real estate because there is a diverse group of people that come together to make a project is don't be afraid to ask the dumb questions. Um, this entire platform is just an upper, an opportunity for me to ask dumb questions, yeah, but act I like, like I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I, I, I think anybody can do it. Um, cause, and I think that's what is kind of nice is that 
an architect can put in some sweat equity, you know, just do the drawings. And then it's, you know, if you can get a price on that and the pencils, then it's like you're kind of off to the races if you can find the right partners to deal with. Great. Uh, where can, if, if someone's listening to this and they want you to do their architecture or something like that, how can they get a hold of you? Um, it, you can reach out on LinkedIn. It's just John Galbraith AIA um, or um, it's, it's uh, element-design.co. Just reach out on the website and um, yeah, I'd be happy to talk to whoever. It's just at the end of the day, I just like, I love doing great projects that are both you know, financially sustainable and, and really help beautify kind of the cities around us. Yeah. John, this was awesome. Thanks. Yeah, thanks.